So you see the title, The Man Who Found Grace. And I'm going to give you a short biography in a moment. And if you think you know who that person is, uh, kind of let me know that you know. And we'll see how far we get. But before we go there, I want to read about something which is not grace. Frank and Terrence, two judges, were each arrested on speeding charges. When they arrived in court on the appointed day, nobody was there. So instead of wasting time and waiting, they decided to try each other. Motioning Frank to the witness stand, Terrence said, how do you plead? And that judge said, guilty, Your Honor. Well, that'll be $50 and a warning from the court. Terrence stepped down and the judges shook hands and changed places. How do you plead, asked Frank. Guilty. Frank thought for a moment. These reckless driving cases are becoming all too common, he said. In fact, this is the second such case in the last 15 minutes. That'll be $300 and five days in jail. <laughs> That's not grace. That's hypocrisy and mean-spiritedness. So who is this person and how does it relate to our sermon this morning? The man who found grace. So here comes the biography. He was born in London in July 24, 1725. His mother was a devout Christian. She shared so much of the scripture with him. She died when he was seven years old. After two years of schooling, he went to sea with his dad. He became a hard-living, godless sailor. He was flogged for desertion from the British Navy. He became captive on an African slave ship. Anybody? Okay, okay. Don't give it away. Um, he, for over a year, he lived half-starved and ill-treated. He was, he was traded to another slave trader on or about March 21st, 1748. That slave ship sank, and he escaped to freedom. Two years later, at the age of 25, he sailed from Liverpool, England, as a commander of his own slave ship. Two months later, his father drowned while swimming. From 1748 to 1750, he began to study the Bible, and slowly his mind began to turn toward God. Through his six years in the slave trade, by his own admission, he misused and abused the slaves on his ship. He told a friend he was slave to every customary vice. In 1754, he finally turned to God. He left the sea life. Through his friends, John Wesley and George Whitfield, he grew, he grew in his faith. He became a gifted author, poet, and hymn writer. In 1780, he became the pastor of a church in London, England. For over 20 years, that church became the center of a great revival, along with English parliamentary reformer William Wilberforce, they led the movement to abolish slavery in England. Here's a historical note that you should be happy about. Of all Christian denominations of that time, the only, only the Quakers and the Anabaptists had denounced slavery. What's an Anabaptist? You all, if you're part of the Church of the Brethren. We are Anabaptists, and we were only one of two denominations that officially came out against slavery. This person died on December 21st, 1807. But in 1779, and now I'll reveal, John Newton wrote the hymn, Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And now that you know the hymn writer better, you'll better understand the hymn. Amen? And we will be singing it afterwards. The title of the hymn, Amazing Grace, and the sentiments behind are centered on God's grace. Newton, having lived such a life, calls it amazing grace. So I have two questions for you this morning. What is grace? And is its impact on your life and mine any less amazing than it was on John Newton's? So let's search the scripture for a moment. And we'll go to Romans chapter 5. Verses 23 to 30. Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 23. Oh, you'd have to have good eyes to read, read that, I guess. Or guess what? You can look it up in the Bible. <laughs> I 
Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but it is not imputed where there is no law. So what happens to all those little babies who die? All those little babies who are killed? All those little children who don't know the difference between right and wrong? They're headed into heaven. Amen? It's beautiful. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned, after the similitude, after the representation of Adam's transgression, who was the figure of him that was to come. Jesus, that is. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded into, unto many. And not as if it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by one offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteousness. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ. The word, the word grace in Greek is defined as favor without payment in return. Favor without payment in return. Something you get and there's no obligation for you to try and pay it back. It's a free gift. By what it was, but what it was, but what was it that made God's grace amazing? What made it astonishing, overwhelming, and surprising to Newton? I mean, that all by itself is enough. But here's the answer. He compared his sinful life to God's salvation and grace. When he put a, his life on the board and said, this is what my life looked like, and this is what God gave me in his, his grace. This is what his salvation means. This is what his forgiveness means. His grace is so much greater than my sin, and I can't get my arms around it. That God loved me enough to, to forgive me of all the stuff that I did. He was fully aware that he had sinned and became fully aware that Christ, what Christ did in the face of that sin. The Holy Spirit puts it together in Romans 5.8. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You didn't have to be good. You didn't have to be perfect. You didn't have to be on the right track for God to forgive you and love you and save you. You just had to come to him just as you are and said, Lord, here I am with all my shortcomings, all my failures, all my faults. I bring them. I lay them at your feet. Please forgive me. Help me not to do these things again. Help me to get on us on a path that leads to heaven. He'll do that. The grace of God is, dis, is diminished if we don't recognize our sin. Think about that. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So what is so amazing about grace if we were not sinners? I mean, if we were not sinners, we don't need grace. But because we are sinners, we do need grace. We need God's forgiveness. We need God's acceptance. We need to receive Christ as our Savior. And he's not standing at the portals of salvation and said, first do this. He's asking you to believe. He's asking you to trust. He's asking you to confess. These are things you can do. So sin separates us from God, but just how far away as a human race have we drifted? The Apostle Paul presents a list in Romans chapters 1 and 2, which demonstrates how the whole human race stands guilty, condemned, and speechless before a holy God. Romans 1.21 tells us, In our ignorance and willfulness, we have rejected the God of creation, despite the evidence of intelligent design. 
even though the facts that we bring out in our study of Genesis on Wednesday nights are concrete facts. It's evidence. And even in the face of so much evidence against evolution and for design and creation, people reject it. Before you even get a chance to speak to some of your beloved friends and neighbors and family members, they just put their fingers in their ear and don't want to hear it. How far have we drifted? Well, Romans chapter 1, chapter 1 tells us, and here's some of the things. We've condemned ourselves. How? Romans 1, 22, 23, because we commit idolatry. idolatry. In other words, some things are more important to, to us than God. Some things we put before God. What do I put before God? What do you put before God? It's a test. It's a question. Is there anything that's before your God that shall have no other gods but me? Romans 1, 24 and 27, sinful and corrupt lifestyles. We're seeing corrupt and sinful lifestyles demonstrated in the public square like we've never seen before. We see unprecedented sin before us and we're told you have to accept it. And if you don't accept this sinful lifestyles, if you don't, if you don't rejoice, if you don't celebrate it, you're not going to be able to get on a computer and talk to your, your, your sister in Florida. We'll just take you off that platform. Shut you down. Romans 1, 28 and 32, our godless pride and cruelty. Part of the things that we see before us is man's arrogance, shaking our fist in God's face and saying, I won't believe you. I won't accept you. I don't care about the Bible. I don't care about things of faith. I've got other things to do with my life. Romans 2, 1 and 4, our own humanistic philosophies. People have traded off God for science. You know, the Bible talks about science and uses the word, but it talks about it as science falsely named. We have a time in which science is being used to prove things that science doesn't prove. I mean, just what's the difference between a male and a female? We can't tell that difference. I mean, hello? And yet, if we can't get these simple things that are obvious, how are we going to get anything much more complicated than that? And finally, Romans 1.32, because we've dragged others into our sinful ways. We're condemned. Human, the human race is condemned. There are people who will stand up and tell you right to your face that there is no such thing of God. Evolution is right. This sinful lifestyle is who I am, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they want to recruit you. What we're seeing in the public schools is simply a matter of trying to recruit our children to something they shouldn't even be thinking about. Amen? They shouldn't be talking about. Amen? These things should not come before them. But this is what Romans chapter 1 was talking about. That when we do these things, we drag others with us. 50 million Frenchmen can't be wrong. Parlez-vous Francais? Our text tells us that God introduced the law for two main reasons. Number one, to define what sin is. How could we know unless we had something to tell us what sin is? Can't always rely on your conscience. We needed something in writing to bring us face to face. And secondly, to bring us face to face with sin and in the cruel face of sin, seek God's grace. Once you know about what sin is, and once you think it through and you carry it through its, to its consequences and realize that it really ends in emotional, spiritual, intellectual death, you would want to turn to God for his grace. Psalm 19.7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Something about seeing God's law demonstrated in front of you makes you know that you're doing the wrong thing and want to do something about it. The raw truth is we can't keep the Ten Commandments. But if we know the Ten Commandments so that when we violate them, we can know it and react to it. And let me give you two examples from, from your life. The speed limit on Route 78 is 65 miles an hour, and nobody does it. Amen, amen? Put the finger to yourself. Come on. I'm putting the finger to myself. 
You're driving 72 miles an hour. You see a cop parked a half a mile ahead. He's the law. What do you do? You slow down. Come on. Because we know the limit and the law, so we conform for about five miles or 10 minutes, whichever comes first. Example number two, you're clipping along Route 78, 78 miles an hour, 13 miles over the limit, justified. We're only going as fast as the rest of the traffic. You're in the middle lane. People are passing you in the left lane, so you're okay. In the rearview mirror, a mile or two right behind you, a police car's lights are blaring, and he's moving fast. He's in the same lane you are. What are you thinking? He's after me. Application. You and I are in the traffic lanes of life. How can we know if we're speeding? We need speed limits, the law. When you've been speeding and you know it, and that cop that's moving at ever-increasing speed, lights blaring, passes you by. You take a breath, a sigh of relief. You've just experienced the cool breath of grace. Amen? Keeping the Ten Commandments, as I said earlier, is not possible. Their purpose is to let us know when we miss the mark, that is, when we sin, when we're speeding, and the purpose is to point us as to Christ. As John 1.17 says, grace and truth come by Jesus Christ. Jesus' grace is not looking for a few good men and women. It can point to with pride. Look what I did. No, it's look what God did. Because there are none. There are no people who have not sinned. There isn't a person in this room, hand up first, who has not sinned. There's no perfect person, hands up. But we work at it. The Bible tells us to work at our salvation. We trust God. We trust that he cares. Christ's grace is looking for condemned, guilty, speechless, and helpless people whom it may save through faith in Christ alone. Just when I thought I was a good guy whose life could balance out my good deeds and bad deeds as entrance to heaven, there stands the law condemning me. Now, I'm going to go down the list of the Ten Commandments, but that I also want to put another line underneath them and ask you, is this what people say? Is this what I, most people say when they hear this particular commandment? I'll give you the first example. Thou shalt have no other gods by me. But I do. It's a person. I put them before you. It's my job. It's my money. Put the list. What else comes before God in your own life? Thou shalt not make any graven images. But I do. I idolize certain people and their lifestyles. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. But I did. My hammer hit a thumb. And I said his name. And maybe more. Amen. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Just what some people say, but I don't. Life's so busy. I can't do it all in six days. Funny, he created it in six days. Honor thy father and thy mother, but I don't. They're too old-fashioned. I know more than them. We just don't get along. Thou shalt not kill. Never did that. Cool. But did you ever try to kill somebody's reputation? Destroy their marriage? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Never did that. What about emotional adultery? which happens every day on the website chat rooms everywhere. Thou shalt not steal. People say, do pencils count? Thou shalt not bear false witness. Does that mean not lying? If it does, I've done it. Thou shalt not comfort, com covet. Does that mean being je jealous? It happens sometimes. So this is a list of the Ten Commandments. These are the laws by which God would let you know when you sin. And these are the excuses sometimes we come up with when we hear those things. Romans 5.19 tells us sin is in our genes. 
passed on to us by our ancestor Adam. Our violation of God's law demands punishment just like violating any other laws. But there is a difference. Romans chapter 5 verses 6 to 10 tells us somebody else paid the penalty for my sin and it's Jesus. In 1936, Fiolello, Fiolello LaGuardia, my favorite mayor, who was later mayor of New York City, was a probate jo judge. A poor white man caught for stealing bread was brought before him, before, brought before his court. LaGuardia found the man guilty and fined him $10. But then LaGuardia came down and paid the man's fine himself. And then he fined the courtroom $50 for living in a city where a man had to steal bread. Then he took up a $47.50 collection from the courtroom to give to the poor man. That's grace. Amen? We want God's grace, but in turn, do we give God's grace? Do we give out and give back to the people in our life God's grace? Do we share God's grace or are we just looking for the one mistake somebody can make and then hang them with it? God's grace was amazing when it was displayed on the cross. God's grace was amazing when John Newton experienced it firsthand. God's grace is amazing today, right now, to those who will recognize that although they haven't sinned the same way as John Newton, their sin is still sin in God's eyes. I have not been slave trader but you and I have been slaves to sin. We stand in need of the grace that only God can give. If you've never asked Christ to forgive you, if you've never asked him to forgive you of that sin, what about today? Remember what he wrote, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Today is the day to step out of your lostness and into his salvation. Today, you, like John Newton, can be someone who has found God's grace and then be someone who can give out God's grace to the people around you. Be graceful, be merciful, and reach people for Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege that we can study a man's life, and in so studying, we learn more about your word and your promises to us. So I pray a blessing upon these folks here today who are in the meeting house and outside of the meeting house. I pray, Lord, that grace would come to us and that we would share with the people around us. Help us to be loving and caring, compassionate. And we thank you, Father, for that privilege we have to serve Jesus because there truly is joy in serving Jesus. Amen.